Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is for you. I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports, episode 651. Welcome in. Full transparency, it is 3.42 in the morning. I've had a very weird couple weeks. I apologize for, like, disappearing. I'll explain what happened and why. It's it's very straightforward. I've just been slammed. Um, it's 3.43 in the morning now because, so I, I we finished 7-on-7. Seven seven. We had football practice tonight around 9 o'clock. I got home at 10 uh, from because I, I drive all over Portland. It's insane. Get home at 10, take a nap. I wake up at, like, 1 in the morning. I'm like, well... I'm awake, and I, I have a, a PS5 now. I hadn't played the NCAA video game at all. I've been so busy. I sat down, I played it for the first time, and I absolutely love it. Like, oh my goodness, it is my favorite football video game I have probably played since Madden 11. I don't know if I would say it's better than Madden 11, but certainly it's in that conversation. Um, after two hours of playing, I can confidently say... It lives up to every expectation you could possibly have. The new NCAA 25 video game is, dude, it's outstanding. It's amazing. It's so fun to play. It's the best mechanic, mechanics I've ever had in a football simulation video game. Like the playing, the the gameplay, the fluidity, the everything about it. it. It's really, my gosh, it's a magnum opus. It's the best. I, I look, actually, you know what? I will commit to this. It's better than Madden 11, my favorite Madden. It's it's my favorite football video game I've ever played. It's so fun. The, the gameplay is incredible. Um, I feel like I can actually make every throw. Like as a quarterback, right? In real life, I could make any throw I wanted because I could decide how the ball was going to arrive to the player. In, in the NCAA video game, the new one, I, I actually feel like I can finally control where the football goes. And it's... It's so smooth. It's so great. Um, the PS5 is amazing. I bought a PS5 last week so I could play this game, and I finally like turned it on today, and it's it's been great. Um, I have been just really, really busy. It's been you know summer. It's I work in HVAC doing sales, and so as you can imagine, when it gets hot, I get really busy. And I've been doing. I leave my house at six thirty in the morning. I work all day. Then I go to football practice. I get home at like 9.30 or 10. It's a really, really long day. There's not a lot of time during the day to do podcast work or do other stuff. Uh, it's been very challenging, actually. Uh, but life's good. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of figuring this out, how to do... Honestly, I, I've, I've committed to too many things. Like, it's the reality of it. I've got a full-time job. I'm coaching high school football, trying to make content. Um, it's bad news, dude. I'm overwhelmed. Like I really am, but I'm, I'm figuring out how to manage the schedule and I don't want to promise anything, but I've got a good plan for next week and think I can do two episodes next week. Actually, I've got a really good kind of handle what I'm doing. Um, but it's, it's been an adjustment, like figuring out how to coach high school football, how to work full time, man. I I'm really lucky. Actually, my, my girlfriend, Molly is, um, so gracious and kind. Like I get home so late at night and she's like hey dinner's ready if you want food i just warmed it up for you to come home to someone who's nice and happy to see you and then also has food ready for you is just like the greatest thing ever i really i i hit a home run with my girlfriend and she'll be my wife someday i'm, I'm really 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 fortunate um with her and her kindness and, and patience because i i have been gone like i she barely sees me right now and uh I want to read a, a, a write-in um, on Patreon. And by the way, I'm going to call this episode, I don't know what the name is, but for me, this episode is kind of a, a shit or get off the pot episode. And I, and pardon my French, but um, I've got a lot of stuff I've been working on. I've got a lot of clips of Tom Brady, and I've got clips from uh, a Tom Curran podcast where Mac Jones, quarterback coach, talked about what went wrong with the Patriots. I've got some clips of Damian Harris talking about uh, what went wrong with Belichick and kind of the philosophy there. I have all this stuff I've been working on and it's not ready and I haven't really had time to sit down and prepare it. And I was like, you know what? I should sit down and record a podcast because it's it's really bad. The longer time you take without recording a show, the more out of practice you get, honestly. So I am, I'm doing this episode to answer some Patreon questions, talk about some stuff I've got rattling around in my head, talk about 
the receiver show, talk about Hard Knocks Giants, talk about the NCAA video game. Um, certainly there's things I want to talk about, but this is me really trying to just get something out and, and keep the muscles, you know, um, flexed, I guess, or, you know, keep the, I don't want to lose my ability to do a podcast. The longer you, you take between episodes, the more out of practice you get. So this is me doing something to keep the show going basically. Uh, and hopefully I can do a much better job next week of providing like timely stuff that makes sense and has like detailed stuff and a central theme. But um, if you want to hear me talk about football, that's what this show is absolutely going to be today. Um, I want to read a question from Patreon. Marcus wrote in on Patreon said, Hey, Zach, longtime listener, have enjoyed listening to the show for the last five plus years. Two questions. Number one, is there any part of you that is interested in becoming a fan of a team? I know you are, quote, against being a Mariners or a Seahawks fan, but I'm wondering if any part of you wants to pick a team for the sports you love. No, I will never probably ever have a favorite team. I, you know, the only team I openly root for, I love Hawaii football. I, it's like my dream job. Um, like in the NCAA video game, I play as Hawaii. I, I start a dynasty with Hawaii. I love Hawaii football. I would love to someday, like this will never happen but I would love to be the head coach of Hawaii football and just recruit Hawaii football and try to turn them into a powerhouse. I think that's a program with so much potential that's un, underrealized or unrealized, basically. Um, I love Hawaii. I love the place. Um, it's the only team I'll ever you know, root for, but that's just because I love Hawaii, like the location, the place, the people, the culture. Uh, being a fan of a team is painful, and I'll, I'll never do it again. I just don't like being a Mariners fan, a Seahawks fan, picking a team. I root for people and players, which ironically, the reason I like Hawaii football, right? Is because I like the people in Hawaii. It's the same. Yeah, I root for coaches and players. I love Mike McDaniel, the Dolphins head coach. I love Tua. Um, but if they leave Miami, I'm not a Dolphins fan. I'm a Mike McDaniel fan and a Tua fan. Does that make sense? Like I root for people, not organizations. And so that's just that's just how it is for me. I'm, I'm not ever going to be loyal to an organization or a team or um, a, a company or anything like that. Uh, but really, the reason I read Marcus's question today is actually his second question, which is this. Marcus says, what is the biggest challenge you will face as a new offensive coordinator in Oregon high school football? Thanks, Marcus. So this is really the, the question I wanted to start the show today with. Um, coaching high school football has been... One of the more difficult things I've ever done, um, and actually not for the reasons you would think. The football side of it is rewarding and fun, and I, I think the X's and O's are are really like fun. And I, I think I know football really well. Like I actually think I've got a great plan for our team and for the offense and our approach and how we're doing stuff. And um, I think I've got a knack for how to teach. What you know, I, I don't install a play unless I'm really confident I can teach it and thoroughly explain why we're doing it and how we're doing it um you know you got to be really careful when you install a play as an offense um there's a guy i love who i, I work with who want has all these ideas but if you can't articulate the ideas to your players it doesn't matter it's totally unhelpful and i gotta remind um him of that occasionally like hey we gotta be if we're gonna have an idea if we're gonna install this if we're gonna put this in we have to really clearly teach it in a, a very simple way so players can follow along. So anyway, the football side of it has been really like rewarding and fun and, and challenging. I'm learning a lot, um, but it's been like time-wise has been insane. I, I don't think I was prepared for how much of a time commitment uh, coaching high school football is. And it's it's a lot to like work full-time. I'm one of the only guys on our staff who doesn't work at the high school. So I'm not, they have, they, they work at the high school. So they have, when school is out, they're also off of work. And during the summer, they're not working. I work full time. In fact, my busiest time of year is the summer right now. You know, when it's hot in the HVAC world, that's like our Super Bowl, where when people need AC, that's what I do. And I'm kind of weird at my company where I'm not just a salesman. I was a technician before so I kind of do everything I get called to fix stuff I get called to do little repairs I get called to have conversations about buying new systems for customers I'm kind of the 
the utility man at my company. I do a bunch of different stuff and I wear a lot of different hats depending on the day. So I've just been going nonstop. And then on top of that, I'm moonlighting as a high school football coach. And it has been a lot, like really, really hard. So first of all, the time part of it, like the time commitment has been really, really difficult. And uh, what I'm realizing too is, you know, thankfully, football season is actually the slower period of HVAC. It's after summer, but before winter. So the weather's kind of mild. It's our shoulder season, September, October, the first week of November. November is when things start kicking off again. People want to buy furnaces and get in the market for, um, you know, preparing for winter basically. But um, the mild part of fall is when HVAC slows down a lot and that coincides with football season. So I think it's going to be okay during football, but the last couple of weeks uh, as weather's gotten really hot uh, and my company's booked out like through most of August, it's been crazy. Uh, it's been really, really challenging and a lot. Um, and then on top of that, you know, one, one thing that really surprised me that I was not prepared for, um, is I'm an introvert. Like I'm very much, I don't know that people know that about me. I can talk forever about so many things, but I am very much a person who I need alone time to recharge. You know, uh, my girlfriend, she works overnight as an ER nurse in Portland. And so she's gone at work right now. I've had the night to myself and it's actually been very much what I needed. I need some alone time in my office, playing NCAA, resting, recharging my mind by myself. It's been really good. But when you do sales all day and you're working with customers and then you're working with coaches and players, it's a lot of peopling and going and interpersonal relationships and managing people and talking with people. And man, I've been, I've been more tired than ever in my entire life. Um, I'm also getting older. Like I can't do I mean, I, I, I'm about to say this as it's 3.54 in the morning, but I really can't do all-nighters anymore the way I used to. Like, I had to sleep for a while before I could get up and do the podcast and hang out. Um, I'm just not, I'm not the person I once was who could just n pull all-nighters constantly all the time. I get exhausted really quickly now. I'm starting to feel like an old man. Um, so the time part has been hard, but the the people, like the the interacting with people that you don't know very well yet and getting to know other coaches and Frankly, it requires a lot of trust to coach with other people. And it's been hard. Like, it's been really, for me, not difficult. Like, we're not fighting. There's no problems. It's just very tiring to deal with people that you're, you're still building relationship with and learning how everyone works together. Um, so the time has been really difficult. The, you know, just, I'm just exhausted. I've been dealing with people a lot recently. Um, and then the one thing that really surprised me that I, I just did not, I could not have possibly anticipated is, you know, a quarterback and a coach relationship is, is so, so important. You have to build trust. You have to work well together. And I, I didn't realize how much I was going to have to work to gain the trust of my quarterback. Like we really, um, I, I love, dude, the kid I work with is, He's so talented. He's way more talented than I ever was. He's bigger. He's taller. He's faster. He's got a better arm. Like this, ki the kid I, my quarterback at my high school is just like he's like a dream. He's really awesome. I, I love the kid so much. Um, and I, I, it's it's learning how to work with him and how I, you know it's just a whole different dynamic. And I don't think he's ever had a coach like me before who's kind of hands on and communicates the way I do and um, it not. I don't yell at him ever. I'm very, I talk to him on his level. Um, I think it kind of weirds him out actually that I talk to him like a peer rather than down to him. I think he might actually prefer it uh, if I talk down to him actually, but I just don't, we, we're, we're kind of partners in this thing. We're doing it together is the way I view it. And uh, it's been really interesting. Like having to gain his trust has been way more difficult than I thought it would be, uh, which is, I just didn't, I don't know why, I don't know why I didn't anticipate that. But it has been a thing that like, oh, I got to like gain this kid's trust. And I don't know what his life has been like, um, whether football or outside of football before. Um, but it's been it's been a lot like so the time commitment's been hard. Dealing with people has been hard. Building relationship with my quarterback has been really um, it's just interesting. You know, I, I just I've got a newfound respect for high school coaches. It's really um 
I don't know, man. I, I, this has been one of the more challenging feats of my life, like building an offense, learning how to coach, and learning how to be present and, and rec- do all the things that requires. Um, I, I got to see it through. Like, I, I can't, I'm, I'm like locked into this thing. I can't, uh, like, there are, there are moments, I'm not going to lie, where I'm like, are you sure you want to do this? Like, you are sacrificing so much money. Like, you can't do sales calls from four o'clock to eight o'clock for a couple months. Um, you're really taking a lot of time off of work. You're really, it's a, it's a huge investment for very little return back to be a high school football coach. Um, but I feel like I have to do it. I, I can't, I, like, number one, I have to be able to tell myself I did it at least once. I got to coach football and be a part of it, and it's, it's really cool. But also, I, I think I can make a huge difference in the role I'm in. Um, and so it's been very... It's been a it's been a really big challenge actually. It's been really hard, um, but it's been like I, I know that's going to be good for me. I, I think I'm going to improve as a commentator, as a football guy, as a man. I'm sure I'll be a better dad someday for this time I'm spending with young men. Um, but you know, 14, 15 year old you know men are you know, young men. It's a it's a whole like I, I I it's easy to forget where you once were. I was once one of those kids and. Um, man, you know, I, I just really, it's a totally different world. It really is. And so, um, it's been really interesting for me. It's been a really, um, challenging thing, but again, not for any of the reasons I would have thought like designing the offense has been fine and coaching the X's and O's has been, yeah, like, I, I think I know football really well. It's been the, um, interpersonal relationships that have been actually the most challenging not even in a bad way just it's draining to talk to people all day and coach them and work with them and learning how someone works and what they need and how to best serve them has been interesting for me um that, you know that leads me to a question from deeply closeted on patreon he says hey zach hey zach what is your coaching style are you a hard ass a softy or a tough but fair kind of guy thanks um, you know, I take a lot of inspiration, uh, I, th- I think from Mike McDaniel, the Dolphins head coach. I love his style. He's, he's kind of quirky. He's weird. He talks like no other coach I've ever seen in my life. Um, I'm, I'm very direct. I'm very low key. I never, I'm never going to yell at people. I just don't, I don't have the, I don't have the energy to yell at a, a young man or a kid. Like these are, they're kids. Like you can't yell at a kid. It's just not fair. It's not cool to me. Unless it's a safety concern or it's like trying to get your attention, like, hey, line up right. I'm never going to yell at anyone. Um, I think I express disappointment, like, hey, I'm, or, or I'll ask questions, like, hey, why did we, um, why did we make this decision? Why did the ball go here kind of stuff? But it's also been really, I have to check myself, like, the way you communicate, you, you, when you ask a player, like, hey, why did we do this? You have to ask them in a way that they feel safe responding. You can't, you know, it's, it's really kind of a delicate balance of, every player needs a different thing from you. Like you can't just treat everyone the same way. And I had a situation today. I was like, Hey, how do I deal with this? And I asked a bunch of coaches and, um, all their responses were like, Hey, you got to punish the kid. You got to do this. You got to do that. And, and I was like, man, I, I think that's a terrible idea. Like respectfully, you know, I, I think that all that would do by being a hard ass in that moment would push the kid away rather than, um, you know, build trust and build relationship. And so, um, it's been, it's been really interesting for me. And I I think I'm going to be a much better person, better man. I definitely am. I'm going to know football better. I have a whole different perspective on football now, even after, like I've barely been a high school football coach. We haven't even started the season yet, but, but through a couple practices, a couple meetings, building the offense, multiple seven on seven events, like I, I'm already like I feel myself um, like changing and growing, and my perspective on on football in general. It's just a different angle. Like I've been around football my whole life. I kind of I take that for granted actually. Like how much as an analyst, as a player, as a camera operator, as a sound technician, as whatever roles I've had, like that all have revolved around football throughout my life and career. Coach is is a new one, and it's just a different angle at the game of football, and it's really interesting. It's going to give me, if nothing else, really great stories for the podcast. Um, like that, I'll be. I, I try to be really careful and cautious with what you know details I share. But um, it's it's really given me a different angle on the game of football that I I never would have thought 
um, I would ever have. And so am I a hard ass? No, not at all. I'm, I'm, I try to be more of a softy. I try to be honest. Like, Hey, I had a player who had a really bad attitude the other day. Um, and I was like, Hey man, you can't like, you, you gotta have a good attitude. Like from play to play, like you gotta keep your head up. And, uh, he's one of our older leaders. And I was like, dude, you, you set the tone for this. Like you're, you're a really important part of our team. Um, but I didn't yell at him. I didn't like, I just, Hey man, like I expect more from you. Right. And I say it very clearly, very plainly like that. Um, so my, my coaching style is very direct. Um, hopefully soft enough that it can be heard. Um, but also I don't beat around the bush. I tell, I tell how it is. Um, but I, I, I really got to be careful. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. If you approach a situation the wrong way, you, you just push people farther away. You don't make them want to listen to you. You don't make people want to work with you. You have to really, um, whether you're dealing with another coach or a player or whoever, you want to ingratiate uh, yourself to people. You want to make people want to work with you and earn trust and build relationship rather than push people away. And it's such a, it's so fascinating that the, the, that side of coaching I never thought about, which is the, the relationship part. And it's, it's really so much more about people and relationships than it is about the game of football. Like, um, it's just interesting to me. I I, I don't know, man. I, I, I've really, I've really been enjoying as much as it's been really difficult for me. Like I'm exhausted. I'm tired. It's a lot. Um, this weird coaching experience has been so good for me. Um, and I know I'm going to be better on the other side of it, but, uh, yeah, like I, I bought a PS five like six days ago. I I've played it twice. <laughs> I, I, I booted it up initially to show my girlfriend horizon zero dawn. It's, she loves it. It's really cool. Um, and then I had to wait for NCAA to come out. I finally played NCAA tonight. Um, but I've just been slammed. It's been really weird. And I'm, I'm kind of getting a grasp on how to, how to do all of the things I'm doing in my life. And it's been really challenging and fascinating. Um, with that said, so next I want to talk about, I've, I've been watching, the, one of the few things I've been doing recently to rest, it's, it takes very little effort, is I've been watching the Hard Knocks show, Hard Knocks off season with the New York Giants. I've also watched a couple episodes of that TV show Receiver on Netflix. I want to kind of review both of them and talk about them. But before we do anything, I got to tell you about today's sponsor. The absolute best thing to do during the summer is go watch an MLB game. You, your friends, you have a cold drink, a hot dog. MLB games are a great time and the Game Time app makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the start of any sporting event. They've got killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Here's what Game Time does for you you can save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. They've got flash deals where you can buy, where you can save, excuse me, even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. There are zone deals where you save even more when you choose a section and let game time choose the seats for you. They've all in pricing where toggling this feature shows a total upfront with no surprise fees at checkout. There are seat views in the app where you can get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy tickets. Game Time has the lowest price guarantee, meaning Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference if you find tickets for cheaper. And Game Time has ticket covers, meaning your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. Download the Game Time app, create an account. And use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create an account and use the code CLNS to redeem $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, that's sponsor number one. Number two is this How do you keep track of all your subscriptions? Can you tell me for sure how many you have? 
and who is taking money from you each month? Have you ever had trouble canceling a subscription? Or have you ever discovered you were being charged for something you didn't think you should be charged for? Well, Rocket Money can help you. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps to lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a few taps. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Plus, they'll even try to get you a refund for the last couple months of wasted money and negotiate to lower your bills for you by up to 20%. All you gotta do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money will take care of the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped its members, on average, save $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash SOS. That's rocketmoney.com slash SOS. Rocketmoney.com slash SOS. All right. Um, you guys are awesome, man. Thanks. Again, I, I had to just record. I've got lots of plans for what I want to do next week. Um, but I, I needed to just sit down and record something. Kind of get the... It's weird. When you take a, a, an unplanned week off, you, you really feel out of, like, out of practice. And then the longer you don't record, for me, it was like, hey, I, now I'm like scared to record or something. I had to just like, sit down and talk. And as I sat down the last 30 minutes, I feel way better, as weird as that is. Um, I want to start by talking about the, the TV show Hard Knocks, an off-season with the New York Giants. It's a special version of Hard Knocks. It's not Hard Knocks training camp. It's not Hard Knocks in season where we saw like the Arizona Cardinals or the Miami Dolphins in previous years. This is basically the only way the NFL could corner the New York Giants into doing Hard Knocks. They said, fine, we'll do a special off-season version of Hard Knocks. Um, it's how the NFL got the Giants to participate who have really dodged it for years. They don't want to do it. And I have really, really actually enjoyed Hard Knocks a lot. I, I got so lucky. It's it's really crazy. My 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 girlfriend um has, doesn't know a lot about football. She hasn't known much about football her life. You know, raised by a single mom. Uh there's no reason she would really encounter football in her life. And just she's just never really been around football very much. But she's been really enjoying getting to know the game and leaning into it and learning about coverages and learning about how Football works in general, the offseason, free agency, all this stuff. So we've been watching Receiver and Hard Knocks, and I've been teaching her about the playbook I'm building, all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's been really, really cool to show her football through this lens. And my girlfriend loves it. I came outside once, and she was watching Hard Knocks with the Jets, and I was just like, You're, you, you, just, you just like it? This, like you would like this product enough to watch it by yourself? Okay, Weird, that's cool. And I know I said Jets, that was intentional, because she was like, I want to see the Aaron Rodgers season. And she watched the entire Hard Knocks training camp from last year just by herself one day. And I was like, that's weird and very cool to come home and you're like, you're just like enjoying football stuff. I'm like, I hit the lottery. Um, but for me, like the biggest takeaway actually from this special Hard Knocks series, Hard Knocks and off season with the Giants is that I really, really... I admire Joe Shane, the Giants' general manager, a lot. Um, he's kind of a dweeby guy. He's kind of nerdy, like a quarter zip and Nikes guy. You're like, you don't have the best fashion. You're kind of a nerd. Um, like, you wonder, like, did you ever play football, dude? Like, how do you, how do, are you sure you know football? But he really, he's very principled. He's very, he's got these core values that I, I love. Um and he, he's absolutely a great general manager. I, I really have come to admire this, this view, this window into Joe Shane, how he operates, how he does business. It's been really cool. Um, first of all, he refuses to go into self-preservation mode at all. You know, he, he says a couple times, actually, like, my job is to do what's best for my franchise. Like, he is a company man through and through. He cares about doing right for the New York Giants, even if it hurts his own career. It's very interesting. Um, he's principled, and he's a guy who I would absolutely feel comfortable 
uh, running my football team. He doesn't overpay for players. He refused to overpay for Saquon Barkley. Um, he's got this this framework of how he makes decisions, and he just sticks to it. And I think it's really very admirable how he handles situations. And it's been really fun to kind of observe Joe Shane and how he goes about stuff. Um, I thought that the way he handled Saquon Barkley was really interesting. You know, he, he allowed he didn't want to pay Saquon Barkley a ton of money. He'd offered Saquon Barkley massive contracts before. And Saquon Barkley basically said, like, I don't want the money. I'm good. I want to go test the open market. So he said, fine, I'll let you test the open market, and we'll see if we can match the contract. And ultimately, um, Philadelphia offered Saquon Barkley a contract the Giants just weren't willing to match, weren't comfortable with. I thought that was interesting. It, it, basically, the Giants had other needs. They said, we need an offensive line. We need to work on our defensive line. They traded for Brian Burns. They brought in a couple offensive linemen. They spent money in other ways rather than at the running back position. It was very re- very reasonable and, and very wise. I thought the way that Joe Shane handled the offseason, what we've seen so far in the show, three episodes in, the way he rebuilt some of the stuff going on in New York, um, it showed wisdom to me, and I really like it. I don't know what the Giants are doing this year. I don't know where they're headed. Um, I've certainly got concerns about their quarterback, Daniel Jones, who, I mean— I've been watching with my girlfriend. My girlfriend hates Daniel Jones. She's like, he is a total boring finance bro. And she's not wrong. He, he comes across like a private school, out of touch, kind of snobby finance dude. Like he's got the, Daniel Jones has the personality of like a wet paper bag. He's just not very exciting. He's not very interesting. Um, I, I, don't, I would not follow him into battle at all. And it was interesting to watch Watch Daniel Jones on TV with someone who doesn't really know football and kind of just getting an interpersonal read on Daniel Jones. My girlfriend was like, who is this guy? Like, This is their quarterback? Like, what? The? She couldn't believe, like, oh, my God, this is the guy that they pay a ton of money to? That's crazy. Um, and it was, it was fascinating to hear her, you know, insight as a person who just evaluating him as a person, not as a quarterback. Um. One big takeaway to me, man, is that it would be so fun. It would be so much fun to work in an NFL front office. It's like the conversations they have. The They sit around in a, a war room, basically, and talk about players and value and where, what they think they should do and how they should handle a situation with a certain player. Should they offer him money? Should they offer him a contract? Should they trade for him? Should they draft him? Like, It's the kind of conversations I could absolutely have every day of my life all the time these football conversations about what do we do with this player or that player it just i've never i never ever considered a career in football really it's it's weird i never did but i never did it would be so much fun to be a college football recruiter or work as a scout or work in a some kind of front office for an nfl team like the the conversations they get to have as their job it's so cool. And it's funny because some of the guys in the Giants office come across like normal dudes who just happen to work in a football building. It's like they're just normal office workers. That the office they work in has to, you know, pertains to football, basically. But it's so interesting how the Giants front office specifically works. Um, and there's this one guy who really, really stands out to me. You'll see him in an episode. I think it's episode three. His name is, I want to get the name right. I believe it's Ed Trigg. Ed Triggs. Ed Triggs is the director of football operations. If you look on the Giants front office website, you got to scroll way, way down before you find him. And there's not a picture. You actually have to like click on his name, then Google him. And through LinkedIn, you can find it. Oh, that's the guy from the show. He's this bald guy who the dude made so many deals. You can, when you're watching Hard Knocks, like this dude is a salesman, man. He's making deal after deal after deal. Um, his name is Ed Triggs. He's probably going to be a general manager at some point. You just can tell. He's kind of a rock star in that building. And I don't know if other people picked up on that, but he was definitely doing a lot of work to help the Giants land players. And he's bringing a lot of value to the New York Giants front office, for sure. He's the kind of guy I would imagine they're going to train and kind of groom to become a, a general manager someday. Like I would not be shocked if someday Ed Triggs ended up leaving the New York Giants 
to go work as a general manager or do an elevated role in a, as a front office worker for another NFL team. He just came across like a rock star who's going to definitely work his way up through that ladder and work his way up through that field. Again, the name is Ed Triggs, and he is... Uh, I just I just thought he was a really impressive closer, basically. Just landing player after player after player, making things happen. Drew Locke, uh, lineman. The, what's the name of the guy? John Runyon, I believe, is the, the lineman from the Packers they got. Like, just, man, just landing player after player. Ed Triggs is the name, and he is absolutely awesome. So, um, I, and I, I also thought, this is kind of a weird thing. I don't, I don't know if this is going to get me in trouble or not. Hannah Burnett uh, is a, she works in the, the front office for the Giants as a scout, and she seemed like a voice that was much needed. It's kind of a measured, balanced person uh, in the Giants' front office. I, I, I don't know, man. I, I think it, it's very easy for... See, this is where I might get myself in trouble, and I, I, I'll be very... I don't want to get in trouble. I want to be... I, I try to be actually cutting edge and, and really thoughtful here. I think it's really easy for football to become kind of a boys' club and kind of a this little self-congratulatory space that doesn't challenge itself and doesn't really grow from... and and look within very often. Hannah Burnett brings a different voice to the Giants front office, you can tell. And I, I think it's good for them. I would imagine like that's the kind of person you need to challenge the typical beliefs. And I, I really just I just I just got the sense like she is really good for the Giants front office. I really based on the conversations, based on some of the questions she was asking, I was like, oh, this woman is is really, really good. And it's cool to see someone like her working in football. Frankly, a woman working in football. Um I think I just think we need more women in, in places like that in, in roles that we don't normally, um, I, I think because women don't have a background playing college football, we're like, ah, they, we, we don't think of them as scouts, but like she's, I, I have no doubt, a really helpful, great scout and good evaluator. And I, I think someone that brings a sense of measure to, uh, measurement and, and a sense of level-headedness to their conversations. Um, I don't know, man. I really, you know, another fun job that I saw in this show is the media trainer, the guy who is, basically there's a guy who sits down with Joe, Sh- Joe Shane, the general manager for the Giants, and goes, here's what they're saying in the media. And he helps him prepare for interviews and press conferences, saying like, here's how we should answer everything, here's the things we should say, and that seems like such a fun job, helping Joe Shane, the Giants general manager, prepare for press conferences. I just, I don't know why I never considered a career working in a front office for a football team, but there are so many jobs that would be so fun. Like working in that space would be awesome. And maybe um, that's something I should, I, I, I don't know. I, I really like where I'm at. I like my life. I'm really happy. But I just see jobs in football and go, oh, that'd be really cool. Like that'd be really rewarding to just do football stuff all day would be awesome. And uh, I don't know, man. I really like it. Again, though, Daniel Jones. <sighs> Daniel Jones, the Giants quarterback, um, you know, the big note I have here, charismatic leader. He's not at all. I, I don't I don't hate him, but I don't like him at all. He just comes across like a total boring guy. Like him, John Mara, the president of the Giants, also seems incredibly boring. It's not a shock John Mara would be happy with Daniel Jones as his quarterback. It's like, oh, you don't. You don't value personalities at all because you don't have one. <laughs> That's so mean, but it's like, uh, I, I'm not far off base. I don't know, man. I really, uh, I just, I've enjoyed this show. I, I, if you haven't watched it, I, I guess I should have said spoiler warning, but I don't think I really spoiled anything. If anything, I probably have encouraged more people to watch it. But if you have HBO, you should really watch the, the New York Giants Hard Knocks show. It's really awesome and really, really cool. And I've, I've enjoyed it so much. I really, as a football nerd, a guy who just loves the game of football and loves nerding out about this stuff, it's been so fascinating and interesting to watch this show go down and um, the conversations they have, the way they talk about football players. It's just really interesting and very, very cool. All right. um, I guess, you know, truly, spoiler warning here, I want to talk about um, the TV show Receiver. It's a Netflix show. You know, we had the show Quarterback, and then the follow-up is, you know, the second year is now they've got this TV show, Receiver, all about receivers. And the five receivers they follow along with 
in this show. And I, I, I guess, spoiler warning, I don't know that I'm going to spoil anything, really. I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. Of, but the thing with this kind of show is it's a recap of stuff we already know happened. Like, we watched the... Detroit Lions beat Kansas City week one because they follow Amon Ross St. Brown. And it's like, I remember this happening. There are key moments and key parts of the season. I just watched the, there was a game where Debo Samuel and George Kittle and the 49ers obliterated the Dallas Cowboys. And I'm like, I remember that game week five very clearly watching the Cowboys get smacked and having fun doing that. Um, but the five receivers they follow are Amon Ross St. Brown, Debo Samuel, Devontae Adams, Justin Jefferson, and a tight end George Kittle. And uh, I don't know, man. A lot, of, a lot of things stand out to me. First of all, um, Justin Jefferson's really interesting. He's kind of this... He's actually kind of a quiet, normal dude who plays a character of himself called Jets. You know, Jets is like his alter ego, Justin Jefferson, where that's the guy who wears the jewelry and has the glitter and the glam and is boisterous and confident and boastful it's Justin Jefferson putting on a persona to basically allow him to perform better and be more confident and be this the swagger, you know, have the swagger and be the braggadocious guy he is. I don't think that's actually who Justin Jefferson is. I think that's how he gets himself hyped up to play football at a high level. It's really I would have never thought of this before, but Justin Jefferson basically becomes a character of himself in order to lock in and be his best on game day. And that's like such a fascinating psychological thing like oh like huh what an approach what a what a way to do that uh on top of that Devonta adams is awesome like i Devonta adams to me is coming across like a really really cool dude I, I really his wife is like nice and sweet and it's i would say Devonta adams is kind of like the kirk cousins of the receiver show where kirk cousins came across like so cool family man really awesome dude Devonte Adams has the exact same appeal in this show. Awesome wife, really level-headed, good dad, loves his kids, normal dude, not crazy, like not a Terrell Owens loud receiver, just a guy who loves football, loves his job, and loves his family. Um, Debo Samuel comes across like a great dad. Almond Ross St. Brown's in a totally different part of his life. He's young, he's, he's growing his career. George Kittle seems like a wild man. His wife is, you know, they met at Iowa and... They've, his wife's got like party buses. It's just fascinating. Like watching all these people and who they are off the field is really, really interesting. Um, you know, one uh, watching with my girlfriend Molly, she absolutely loves, loves, loves Dan Campbell, and it's it's actually really funny uh, in the 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 Netflix in the HBO show Hard Knocks off season with the Giants. You see. Brian Dable joking about running a 40 yard dash and it's really cringy him actually seeming very like it's like a lack of respect for the players Brian Dable the Giants coach and you see the exact opposite with Dan Campbell the Lions head coach he really respects his players you can tell he's a former player he's been in their shoes before so he actually seems to operate a bit of a different way and you know I, I don't mean to talk about Molly the entire time but it's interesting to hear her perspective she just loves Dan Campbell and was totally unimpressed by Brian Dable because of the way he talked about the players. And you're like, oh, it's interesting insight that, you know, a former player like Dan Campbell really seems to respect the people who work for him a lot more than Brian Dable does. Just the way Brian Dable talked about players and kind of, you know, the, the 40 yard dash thing was weird. He's like, oh, I could, I could totally run a seven second 40 yard dash. I could run blah, blah, blah. Like, it's like, dude, you you're so far out of it. Just it just rubbed me the wrong way, um, and it was uh, interesting to me. Um, I really, you know, George Kittle and his wife are really sweet. He's like, my wife recharges me. I thought that was really sweet and really really cool. George Kittle is so positive and full of energy. It's awesome. I don't know, man. Um, you know, one one big thing that really stands out to me is I watched Amon Ross St. Brown uh, his toe get caught in the turf. It's just a reminder. Every NFL team should have grass. Absolutely. It's the money's there. It's a, they can, everyone can afford it. It's a safety issue. And it's crazy to me. We don't have grass, you know, like literal, not, not turf, not AstroTurf, not plastic turf, not rubber turf. No, every NFL stadium should have actual, real, authentic grass that they grow in the stadium. Everyone can afford it. It's not a crazy thing. 
and it would be way safer and better for players. And it's it's unbelievable to me that that's not a universal standard in the NFL. Um, but I've really the show is awesome, man. Um, I, I really enjoy. I just encourage you watch it. Basically, you know, you you get insight into how tough these guys are. They get grade three um, ligament tears, which means basically your ligament is not attached to your bone anymore. You know, my, my girlfriend's a nurse. She's been explaining to me the injuries and her medical perspective on football injuries has really like opened my eyes to how horrific and, and tough some of the stuff that NFL players go through. It's like, oh my gosh, dude, like, I don't know. To not have your ligaments attached at all to the bone and you're just playing through it, taking painkillers to keep going. And that's just a receiver, let alone what offensive linemen do. And I, I think that's my biggest takeaway from this show. Receivers, okay. I really loved quarterback Patrick Mahomes, Marcus Mariota, Kirk Cousins. Receivers, pretty good. It's not as good as quarterback was. And the position I really want to see, like the thing that I would kill for, I want linemen. I want to see an offensive lineman oriented docu-series where we follow offensive linemen, get to know them, what their life is like, their day-to-day. Offensive linemen are far and away the unsung heroes of the football world. Um, I work at HVAC, right? I, I sell air conditioners, but I sell them, and then there's a team of people who install them, and I was an installer before the job I have now. Installers are the kind of crucial, most important part of any HVAC company. When you you can sell a ton of air conditioners, but if there's no one to install it, it doesn't matter. Or if they install it and do a bad job, it also doesn't matter because then you've got an upset customer. They are the offensive linemen of the HVAC world. They're underappreciated and often don't get the credit they deserve and, and aren't treated with the respect and import, like the importance they, they bring to the table. Linemen are the same way. And I, I really, really want to see a docuseries centered around NFL offensive linemen. It would be so fascinating. Receiver's cool and interesting, and they're the sexy position, but actually I think the the unsexy position, the offensive linemen, would be really fascinating. And also, I look, I'm, I'm in a different part of my life now. I watch everything with my girlfriend now, and I have no doubt she would be way more interested in the life of an offensive lineman than a receiver. I just, I, I find, I think if you want to make a show that's, got universal appeal to women, an offensive lineman show would be really, really brilliant. A great angle as a producer. That's what Netflix should do for their next season of whatever docuseries, whatever NFL players they follow this offseason or this season as they go through the NFL. Um, They should have a camera following four or five NFL offensive linemen this year. And then they turn that product into a documentary series called Linemen or something. It would be Maybe they call it linemen win games. I would love that. That's a great idea, and that's absolutely what Netflix should do next for their next docu series. Um, that's all I really have to say. I, I really enjoyed the shows, both Hard Knocks and Receiver. They're interesting. They're good shows. Um, I love Joe Shane a lot, the Giants general manager. He's awesome. I love Devonte Adams. I love Justin Jefferson. is fascinating. I don't. Don Adams has gained my respect a lot. He's he's a really, um, he's a tough dude. He's a good leader. He cares. He's a veteran. I really identify. I really just I like Devonta Adams a lot. He's been the standout to me of this receiver show. And if you haven't watched it, highly recommend it. It's awesome. And again, I want to say this one more time because I, I I mentioned it briefly. I got a PS5. I played the NCAA video game today. It's so fun. It's the new NCAA video game is the mechanics are amazing. Like every feature you could ever want in a game, laterals, speed options, pitches, the ability to slide, the way you throw the ball away, the mechanics of quarterbacks where they don't, they every, all the physics are realistic for the way they move in and out of the pocket. Uh, The mechanics are better. It's, it's the best, most fluid mechanical, mechanically fluid football video game I've ever played in my entire life. It's so perfect to play. It's like, it's just like I've always imagined a football video game playing in my head. That's how this new NCAA video game plays. 
it's perfect. It's a dream. I really love it. I can't recommend it enough. If you are a guy who loves Madden and maybe you grew up playing Madden and if you're like me, Madden got old. I got really sick of it. I loved Madden 11. None of the new Maddens really stuck with me. I didn't play them. I didn't like them. Finally, we've got a game worthy of what Madden 11 and frankly NCAA 14 were the two best football video games ever we've got a new best in show we've got a new best NFL we got a new I guess not an NFL game it's a football game though you've got a new best football video game but we can now play and enjoy and can be the new gold standard for what is uh and should be football video games moving forward I was really stuck for years with Matt Madden 11 is now 13 years old and I've been playing it it might actually be 14 because I think it came out in 09 or in 2010 actually technically um Madden 11 has been the game I've been playing on Xbox 360 and PlayStation for years like not refusing to move forward because I just didn't I loved it and I didn't like the new stuff finally a game has come that can take the place of Madden 11 and I can be happy and comfortable playing on current gen consoles because i've got a football game that is good enough for once finally and i'm very very happy to be able to say that um let's answer questions from patreon if you want to support the show go to patreon.com slash zach shomler patreon.com slash zach shomler it's a dollar a month it's a great way to support me um it uh it's also the best way to get access to me. If you want to write into the show, it's a dollar a month. I don't guarantee to look at your to, to read your question on the show. My only guarantee, I look at every single write-in with my eyeballs and I pick the top couple to read on the show. The little down and dirty secret is I read basically 99% of what gets written in on Patreon. I read it on the podcast. It's very rare for me to not read something on the show. And uh, yeah, I like it. It's really fun to interact with you guys. Thanks for supporting the show that way. And it's a really good way to get interesting and thoughtful questions from the audience. Devin writes in. Devin says, hello, Big Mac Zach. I like that a lot. I like HVAC Zach better, but I'll take it. Super important question. You talked about the Google Nest in a recent episode and how it's not one of your, uh, it's not one you're a fan of working on. Well, after having some thermostat problems, I saw a Google Nest my dad bought sitting on the counter. And it looks like he plans on switching to that. I'd love to hear an expert analysis about the Google Nest and why it's not a system you'd recommend. As always, I look forward to the next show, Devin. Devin, uh, I've been an HVAC technician for a long time. I now do HVAC sales. I work with HVAC equipment every single day. I install stuff. I install thermostats, temperature sensors. I've installed full systems, AC units, furnaces, ductwork, whatever you want. I've done it all in, in the HVAC world. Um, a Google Nest is great on paper. They promise a lot of things and they deliver horribly with most of them. They are a very disappointing product that uh, often, because of the things they promise, cause more headaches than actual solutions. Uh, people think they can do all these things that are just frankly unrealistic. I've seen them fall off of the wall, by the way. They like, if you install them a little bit crooked, they just, they never really fully stay on the wall. They fall off. And you see a lot of homeowners put them in themselves and then have all these problems. And so I've had to go many times and fix them. They also cause a lot of problems with, we sell train equipment and train, the best way to operate a train furnace or air conditioning unit is with a proprietary train thermostat. It's, it's the controller. It's kind of like having a PlayStation 5 and then, therefore, a DualSense PlayStation 5 controller. You want the controller that comes with the PlayStation 5. It does a better job than some random third-party thing you buy off the street. It's the same with HVAC equipment. And when you use a third-party Google Nest and you connect it to all this BS and Wi-Fi and all this... Um, I mean, a Wi-Fi controlled thermostat's not a crazy proposition, by the way. But the the things people try to do with their Google Nest uh, often end up causing problems and breaking and not working properly. And um, I guess the point I'm trying to say here is that the Google Nest promises to do a lot of things, and it does all of them poorly. They never quite work. Customers are often very unsatisfied. Um, I mean, I've seen people that are happy with them, too, but I, I've just seen... 
the dark side. And I've had so many problems where customers' expectations don't align with the reality of how the product works. And it causes me a lot of headaches. So Google Nest, um, it's a fine thermostat. Um, but it's certainly, if you're going to have one, keep your expectations low, measured, um, and don't expect it to do anything crazy because they promise they can do a lot of crazy stuff, but often um, in practice, it's not possible. And that's not me. That's homeowners doing it themselves, causing themselves headaches that I have to often go fix. Kenny writes in. Kenny says, hey, Zaddy. No, we're not doing that. You could call me HVAC, Zach, please. <laughs> Kenny says, Galactic Republic or Galactic Empire? Or no Star Wars at all. Anyway, cheers, Zaddy. P.S. Hi, Zaddy. No question, but since you hate that I call you Zaddy, I've decided on a new name for you. Big Sack Zack. Anyways, cheers. Is that worse or better? I'm not sure. Big Sack Zack or Zaddy? Neither is good, but whatever. You can, you're can. you the one paying money on Patreon. You can call me whatever you want. It's fine. Um, I had to Google what this meant, Galactic Empire or Galactic Republic. I was like, what, what does he mean? And then I realized, oh, yeah, it's, do you mean the, the years where the Jedi kind of were in charge, the Galactic Republic or the Galactic Empire when the evil empire, <laughs> Emperor Palpatine, was ruling the galaxies? Or the galaxy, I guess, just one of them probably, in a galaxy far, far away, so just one galaxy. Um, obviously... The Galactic Republic is better because there wasn't this horrible, invasive overlord running things. The Galactic Empire in the Star Wars universe has got this oppressive leader, Emperor Palpatine and Darth Vader, running the show. And they're terrible and awful to people and they do horrible, heinous things. So how is this even a question, Kenny? What do you mean, Republic or Empire? Uh... No, the Empire is terrible and would be horrible to live under, and uh, the Republic theoretically lets you live your life in peace and leaves you alone for the most part. So, um, yeah, I'll take the Galactic Republic over the horrible overlord, overreaching Galactic Empire any day of the week. Yeah, the oppressive Empire? No way. That sounds terrible. Justin writes in. Justin says, Yo, HVAC, Zach. I appreciate your advice with my moving to Oregon slash Washington question. Just want to clear a few things up. You make a few mentions of me wanting to be in a more right-leaning and warmer area, when in fact, it's the opposite. I'm trying to get somewhere more left-leaning and cooler because I, pardon my French, fucking hate the heat. I'm baking here right now with 103 degree dry heat as I type this in Texas. With that being said... I appreciate your recommendations and will definitely be adding them to the list of places to check out next year. As an outdoor guy, Bend, Oregon sounds very lovely. Also, I vibe very hard with the idea of no state income tax with Washington. Thanks. Here's my, my little comment, Justin. I live in downtown Portland, Oregon. How do I say this nicely? Portland has some really glaring, frustrating flaws. I like where I live. I like the people. I like the food. Um, I, I think I'm I'm somewhat in the middle politically. I don't. I'm not really right or left. I'm just kind of agnostic. I I pick and choose my battles, and sometimes I, I find myself on the right. Sometimes I find myself on the left. I don't have a side. Um, Portland irritates me often, and I'm a, I'm I'm a pretty you know, and and I I just have a hard time believing anyone who grew up in Texas would not move to Portland, Oregon and be just completely culture shocked, just flabbergasted. I mean, man, I've been to Austin, Texas, and Austin, Texas thinks it's left-leaning and thinks it's all this stuff. Austin is nowhere near as fucking weird and outside the box is a nice way to put it as Portland. Portland is a big step further than um, than, than Austin or anything in Texas. I, I just can't... I can't stress enough. I think someone who grew up in Texas or lives in Texas for a long time is going to find such culture shock if you move to Portland, Oregon. I just really, please visit it. Please do your research. I think Vancouver, Washington with no state income tax would be right up your alley. Um, I, I just, I, I often find myself getting pushed to my limits in Portland, Oregon. I can't imagine how someone from Texas would feel. So that's my advice. My two cents. Um, 
Christian writes in and says, what's up, Zach? Congrats on the new apartment and the upward trajectory your life has recently taken. I've been watching for years, and Zach in a truck was definitely the most entertaining Zach I've ever seen. I love that. That makes me happy to hear. A few episodes ago, episode 641, you mentioned if you could go back to 10 years old, you choose to become an airline pilot. Being a flight instructor and soon to be airline pilot, what made you not go after that if it was a dream of yours? If you're ever in the New York area, let's grab a plane and fly the Hudson River and get a burger and beer after. Stay cool, Christian. Christian, first of all, dude, I would fucking love to fly with you in New York. Let's do it. I'm all in. I will, I'll make that happen. That let's, let's, if you can get me in a plane and fly with you, I would love, love, love to do that. Christian, um, here's why. So I, uh, first of all, when I went to college, the plan was college football. I didn't ever really consider my degree. I didn't really ever have a plan for my career other than football. There's not a lot of places you can play college football that also have a flight school, right? They're, they don't coincide. Flight schools are kind of their own unique thing. And then by the time I was old enough to realize, hey, I should do this as my career, I couldn't even get a loan to go to flight school. Like flight school is incredibly expensive. So uh, I just think the cost prohib- prohibitive nature of becoming an airline pilot kept me kind of away from that. You have to have a lot of money in order to go to flight school, basically. Um, I'd love to do it. It'd be cool. I, I, I also think at this point now, my life is, I like being home every night and being a commercial airline pilot would really suck. But there was a period of my life where I was going to join the Air Force and become a pilot. I was, I actually quit SOS for a while and, and removed it because I knew I, I couldn't, I didn't want to get in trouble with the Air Force when I was applying with them. Uh, and uh, my plan was to become an Air Force pilot and then eventually a commercial pilot. But that, that ship sailed. It's a different life plan that I I almost took basically. Um, but yeah, um, flight school is really expensive is the answer. And I I couldn't afford it. Um, Lee writes in and says, morning, Zach attack. What is, or was your ideal wide receiver, wide receiver skill set? Just a thought. Hope you were having a fantastic day. Um, fantastic. That's how he wrote it. I mean, ideally, every receiver is six foot five, can go get jump balls, and can run, right? Ideally, I got this receiver I coach. His name's Eli. Dude is awesome. Works hard, has a great attitude. Dude, he can go get the rock. He is a great athlete who can win one on one jump balls all day, and we are going to feed this kid the ball. I mean, ideally, that's what every receiver is where somebody can go get jump balls and, and win one on one. Of course. Um, but I think, you know, one ideal skill set that doesn't get talked about a lot. Um, I got this kid, Zai, uh, and he is just, he's going to be a freshman. He's, or I guess he, freshman or sophomore, I can't remember. He, he's, he's really, you know, he's going to be a freshman. He's young. Um, he's been recruited by Central Catholic. We got lucky to get him at our football program at David Douglas. And, uh, he's a great athlete. I mean, he can win jump balls and he's got all this skill set, but the thing he does that's so underrated. He's a great athlete, does all the things right, but he's also got this tremendous feel for spacing. He's really good at finding windows against zone coverage. He just he's just got a knack for how to feel the spacing between defenders. And that's a, a skill set that receivers often do not have, that's rare and special. When you find a receiver who's good at finding windows and creating space and, and finding windows in zone coverage um that's just a rare skill set man that not everyone has the feel for puka nakua the rams uh guy who was a a stud rookie receiver last year absolutely has that skill set puka nakua is not the fastest he's not the strongest but he's got a tremendous understanding of where to go against zone coverage and how to find space between defenders and That's a wide receiver skill set that doesn't get talked about very often. That is incredibly, incredibly valuable. The ability to find windows between defenders is just a a really special, rare thing. All right. uh, Andrew writes in. Andrew says, hey, Zach, hearing your story about coaching high school football is very inspiring. 
I'm going into my senior year of high school and have never been allowed to play football but my, by my parents. Instead, I've become a film manager and radio broadcaster for my local high school's team. I am massively interested in the intricate nuances of the schemes of football. All that nerdy stuff is exactly my passion. For a while, a quiet dream of mine has been to be a defensive coordinator at a high school somewhere in the future. My question to you is, how do I learn? I've been researching and picking up pieces of information on offensive and defensive schemes, but as someone who has never gone through the experience of playing the game, how can I further learn the schematic side of football from a coach's perspective? Anything would help, although I'm quite knowledgeable already compared to most fans. I'm eager to absorb as much information as I can so I can apply it both as a color commentator and as a potential coach one day. Thank you for reading. Have a great day. You should just coach, man. Like I, I think that people don't realize how coaching like freshman football at a high school is is something that's always needed. You need people in the building. And once you're in the building helping with any minor role, you're going to be around football conversations, and it's just your gateway in to learn a lot of stuff. Um, otherwise, like I would look up Coach Dan Casey, listen to his stuff. He's great. Coach Dan Casey, he's been on the podcast before with me. He's amazing. Um, he's quite literally the best resource anyone could ever use to learn about football, but why don't you just coach? Why don't you just go get involved somehow? Like there's middle school football, freshman football, JV football, like all these lower levels of football that always need people involved to help uh, coach. And you could definitely, I'm sure, find a role doing that somewhere very, very easily um, and, and with much lower barrier to entry than you might realize because it's just hard to find people to volunteer to help coach. It really is. Uh, it's even more rare if you actually know what you're doing um, but just finding people that are even willing to help at all is actually a very rare thing that uh, a lot of coaches covet. It's just finding a, a human being willing to do the job at all. So I'm drinking coffee. Uh, it is, it's it's 4.49 in the morning, and I'm drinking coffee to stay awake. Hilarious, weird, weird world we live in. Um, <clears throat> Gabriel writes and says... Hey, 8-Track Zach. The Expanse got mentioned. I really love the series, and I've all actually started re-listening to the audiobooks to help me fall asleep at night. As a story, it's familiar enough that my brain doesn't get too excited. My question is, do you like listening to audiobooks or otherwise reading fiction? I know you love Reacher, of course, but there are are there any others you're really into? I definitely recommend checking out the Expanse book series as it's basically a juicier, more fleshed out version of the Amazon Prime show and some of my all-time favorite sci-fi. Dude, I had a customer, uh, a guy named Bob, who recently told me to read the Expanse books as well. So you're not the first person to tell me that in the last couple days. Um, you know what What book series I... There's a couple of book series I really, really love. I, I like, I guess, young adult fiction, honestly. Um... I really liked, now, hear me out. Shadow and Bone is a, a Netflix show that started as a book series. There's a, a trilogy and then a duology. The trilogy is great. You need the trilogy to understand the next two books. But books four and five, uh, Six of Crows, I believe is what it's called, and something else, Crooked Kingdom maybe, something like that, um, is a, it's a heist story. And it's it's unbelievable. Like the the first three Shadow and Bone books are really good, but the the next two books four and five maybe my favorite all time books. The the sequencing, the storytelling, it's just it hooks you and it sucks you in, and you can't stop turning the pages. It's so dang good. Let me find the name. I, I believe it's Six of Crows. Six of Crows. Yeah, Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. Amazing book, but you have to read, unfortunately, you got to read the first three Shadow and Bone books to understand the fourth and fifth books. But if you can get through five books, the, the, second, the, the, the fourth and fifth books are absolutely unbelievable. Loved them. Uh, audiobooks, I don't listen to it very often. I, I think it's because it's annoying. You gotta like buy them or buy an Audible subscription. And it's kind of just the the paywall part of it is what keeps me away, actually. If I could just buy audiobooks easily and just listen to them, I, I might do that. But it's the whole 
needing Audible and then having a subscription, that actually, weirdly enough, keeps me from doing audiobooks. I, I know that's insane, but that's honest. I hate I hate having subscriptions. I really, really do hate them. And Rocket Money, actually, for real, is a good sponsor for me because it helps me stop having them. Um, but I listened to, at one point, the audiobooks for uh, Ranger's Apprentice. Love them. Ranger's Apprentice would be an incredible animated TV show. It's such a good, well-written show or well-written book series. And then Mortal Engines. Um, Mortal Engines starts about, uh, it starts with these two characters and then ends up telling the story of their children, actually. And it's, dude, Mortal Engines is a really, really, really cool book series. I highly recommend. I, I don't think that detail about their children is really a spoiler. Um, but if I did spoil anything, I apologize. I, I really recommend you read them. I mean, they're really... The Mortal Engine series, the, the movie was was bad and they tried, but it's you can't tell that story in a, a hour and a half, two hour movie. You just you don't have enough time to properly tell that story. Um, like Shrike, the character in the movie, just is not fleshed out at all and kind of makes very little sense because they have to rush everything. They can't really properly sequence it and tell enough of the story. Um, but Mortal Engines is great. Um, Ranger's Apprentice is awesome. Uh Gregor the Overlander made me cry a lot when I was a kid. I love that series. Uh, I love the... What's what's Will Burroughs? Will Burroughs book series. Uh, it is... Um, oh, what is it called? What's in Will Burrow books um, series? It's like a... He like goes... He tunnels down... Uh, deeper it's called uh i i guess it's it's what's the name of the book series D- deeper is the name of the book it, it, it's just interesting uh it's oh tunnels is what it is tunnel the series tunnels is also awesome i guess i love lots of books about digging stuff you know gregor the overlander tunnels um I don't know. I, I, I love a lot of science fiction, but I, I like young. I think I like young adult fiction, actually, a lot, if I'm honest. I still do. As an adult, don't care. Love it. It's exactly my reading level. It's really fun. There's good stories there. Um, I mean, I like I like the Bosch books. I like Jack Reacher. I like heavier stuff. I like Tom Clancy. But something about young adult novels is just it's not too demanding. Like it's it's fun to read. It's not exhausting to read, and I really I really enjoy them a lot. Actually, with no shame, I, they're great. Um, Philip writes in. Philip says, "Hi Zach, longtime fan, first time subscriber to Patreon. Do you have a small FBS college that you hope someday will be a better team? My team would be Eastern Michigan. I went to college there, and I have seen them go from two and ten in twenty fourteen." to going to their first first bowl game in 2016, which was their first bowl appearance since 1987, to winning a bowl game in 2022. They're getting closer and closer to being decent, and I can't wait to take them over in EA College Football 25 to finally get them over the hump. Thanks for reading this with your eyeballs, Philip. Um, okay, I want, I want to see Eastern Washington win and be good they were so close they had vernon adams they had a eric barry they had a couple really good quarterbacks and got to a national title a couple years ago um but the reality is the the one football program they're not i guess they are fbs it's hawaii football hawaii football if they could just get every recruit in the state of hawaii to go there they would have the best college football team in the country i mean hawaii football has so much potential there's a massive fan base. The passion for the team is there. If they were good, they would get more support than anywhere in college football. I mean, the love of football in Hawaii is there. And frankly, Hawaiians are spread all over the country. So you could get money from people. Like people would support all over the country because they love Hawaii and, and there's Hawaiians everywhere. Um, I just think that I want to see Hawaii football be good. That would make me so happy and feel really good. Um, Justin says, hey Zach. Last episode, you discussed the Mount Everest of Rush... The, sorry, the Mount Rushmore... The Mount Everest. The Mount Rushmore of shows you love. So, like, the four shows I really love. Uh, I want to ask you this question again, but with video games. You've mentioned Mass Effect before, which is one of my favorite series, along with Resident Evil. 
I wanted to know your four. Best of luck with the coaching gig. So my four games, these are mine. They're not the best games ever. These are the games I like the most. Horizon Zero Dawn, got to be on the list. I love it. Um, I would put The Last of Us up there. I would put Mass Effect. Probably Mass Effect 2 is the best one. Mass Effect 2. So we got Mass Effect 2, Horizon Zero Dawn, um, The Last of Us, and then I need a fourth game. You know what I would do? I don't even care if this is weird. I would put Jack and Daxter, The Precursor's Legacy. That's I've played that game probably 30 times in my life, all the way through, for real. I love it. It's like my, I just, I can beat it in like, I don't know, seven hours, something like that. Something, something like a day, basically. It's, I just, I just love it. I play it maybe like four hours. I, is that really, is that crazy to say four hours? I have no idea. I, I feel like I've beaten it really quickly before. Um, it's a, a 3D platformer. It's my favorite one. I love 3D platformers. So I'd go, it's funny, two of those games were made by Naughty Dog, actually. I'd go The Last of Us, uh, Jack and Dax of the Precursor's Legacy, Mass Effect 2, and Horizon Zero Dawn. And Horizon Zero Dawn, I, I've been playing, I just started playing it again when I got my PS5. Uh, it's, it's, it's like, it's such, it's comfort food. I, I love it so much. I mean, I, I, I didn't mean to get sucked into it again, but I've been playing it just like 20 minutes here and there the last week. And I just like, I'm so so into it. It's so fun. It makes me, I'm getting all these nostalgic feelings again. It's Horizon Zero Dawn is truly my favorite game of all time. I don't, I, I don't know why people hate on it or don't love it more, but it's, it's amazing. It's really good. Uh, also another game I've been playing, I got, um, Immortals of Avium for like 10 bucks. I'm like three hours into that game. Dude, what a fucking game. Oh my God. Immortals of Avium is so underrated. I don't know why it didn't sell well. It's really sad. It's a, a total flop commercially, but it's an amazing, it's like a magic first person shooter. And if you haven't played it, uh, it's, it's so fun. It's like such a, it's one of my favorite games I've played in years. I'm like, how did this game bomb? It's because EA made it. They don't care. But Immortals of Avium, if you haven't heard of it, you should absolutely play it. It's an incredible first person shooter with like magic instead of guns. And it's just like, it's, it's a great, amazing game. It doesn't belong in the Mount Rushmore video games, but it's a really, really good time. And I, I love it very, very much. Can you tell I'm a PlayStation guy? I love I love PlayStation games. I've got no no uh, problem. I mean, the, the PlayStation exclusives are just amazing. They really are outstanding. Um, Ryan writes in. Ryan says, Hi, Zach. Just got caught up with your episodes, but I'm excited to see that you got involved in Southeast Portland football. It's great to see that you ended up at a school where you can do a ton of good. Makes me happy to see you work in your community. You know, that's really how coaching feels to me. Um, it's, I don't know what I'm getting out of it. I really don't. I'm just, I'm donating a ton of my time and energy. I'm exhausted. It's really hard. Um, but it's definitely, I feel like I'm definitely doing some good. And uh, that's got to be worth it. But it's, I, I, I wonder a little bit every day, like, should I really be doing this? Like, you're tired. It's hard. It's not good for you. I don't know. It's uh it's definitely coaching is going to take a lot out of me and I'm very nervous about it, but it's hopefully going to be a good thing and I'll get through it. And I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I should admit this. I don't know if I'm going to do a second year. I really don't. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, but I, I'm definitely going to at least do this year and, and get through it and then, and then evaluate if it's something I ever want to do again. But, um, I'd, I'd like to, because I, I, I want to, I want to build David Douglas as a program and I, I want to build a good relationship with my quarterback and, coach him for like three years because he's got three years after high school and that'd be really fun to do but um it's taking a lot out of me to do this it really is um very very difficult to be a high school football coach sam writes in sam is a long one sam i want to help you sam says hi zach i need some advice i'm in a bit of a professional dead end right now ever since high school i'd always wanted to be a chef i've spent all my life after high school working to that goal, from culinary school to restaurants to doing private chef work, all to hopefully get me to a point where I'm running my own restaurant someday. This past month, I've absolutely gotten my ass kicked. No other way to put it. I took a job a thousand miles away as a sous chef. 
second in command behind the head chef. I know what it is. Anyway, at a summer camp in Maine. By the way, my dad works in the food industry. I, the writers may not know the food world, but I definitely do very well. Getting the job as a sous chef at the summer camp in Maine was a pretty big jump for me. Although it was only seasonal for the summer, I thought it would look good on a resume. However, I'm leaving to go home this weekend, which is a little under halfway through my contract because the toll this place has taken on my mental health. Just some examples of things I've dealt with are broken equipment, camp directors who don't understand or honestly don't care how kitchens need to operate, a staff who knows that neither myself nor the head chef can fire them, so they simply don't care what we say, general disorganization of the camp where we have 10 people telling us we need to do 10 different things. As of writing this, I'm on my way uh, to my 13th consecutive 14-hour day. I know that food service is hard and labor-intensive, but just know this camp hasn't kept a chef for an entire summer in seven years, and we have lasted the longest since then. I'm aware that this is a terrible situation I stumbled into. Anyway, my head chef, who is a friend of mine from an old job decided this is her last job in food service after 30 years and I'm ready to take a step back and reevaluate my life and potentially swap careers myself. I'm 22 and a lot of my friends are graduating college and getting extremely well-paying jobs and I'm afraid of being left behind if I stay in an industry where large paychecks aren't an easy thing to find. Uh, But I'm also afraid to leave the only industry I've worked in since I was 17. I'm still young and know that I have time to figure out my life, but the passing of time is very a very scary thing. Anyway, sorry for the word vomit, and thank you for reading it with your eyeballs. Any thoughts or opinions are appreciated. I have so much to say, Sam. First of all, I love you, man. Thanks for writing in. Um, I'm 27. <laughs> I finally figured out my career at 27. It took me a long time. You're 22. Chill out. You're fine. You're total, I know it's hard to not compare yourself to other people's timelines, but you are doing totally fine. I would recommend you leave the food service world. My dad works in the food world. He's a GM of a brewery. The food world, my dad's a, he's been a food writer. He's been, uh, he's helped a lot of food carts actually start. Food cart, food truck, whatever you want to call it. Um, the food industry is just brutal. A lot of people don't know this. Um, Last summer, I almost bought a bar for a million dollars. I know that sounds insane. I don't have a million dollars. I was going to buy the bar and make monthly payments to the old owner till I made enough payments that amounted to a million dollars. And once I paid off a million dollars worth of payments, I was going to own the bar outright. I decided not to do that. This bar made $300,000 a year. It was a great opportunity for me to make some good money and have my own business. But I realized... Uh, the food industry is terrible. My dad's recommendation was, eh, like, you should probably just move to Hawaii and be a plumber, dude. Like, you're going to have a better, more peaceful life. The food industry is terrible, man. It really is. Like, you're, you're 22. I would cut bait and run. You're not too far in to quit and go find something else. Quit is the wrong word there. But to pivot and, and find a different path for your life, man. Um, the food industry is, is really hard. There's a reason, like, every chef I know is like on drugs or really, really living rough, man. I, I really, I mean, the, the, every chef I know has a really tough story and a really tough life. And I just, you're young enough, you can walk away before ever getting into all that. Just walk away, man. Find something else. I know that's a crazy, that's a, it's a real, I don't mean to be flippant about that, but Dude, you'd be better off as an electrician, honestly. Like, go go get a, a trade job. You'll have better hours. You'll make more money, a better sc- schedule. I don't want you to be 35 and be like, fuck, I chose the wrong thing. You're still young enough. You can make a change, man. Don't get 10 years into this career and then be like wanting kids and you can't even afford that and you feel like you can't make a change. By the way, no matter how old you are, you can always change your career. But you're you're so young. You're 22. Find a different path. You're going to be fine. I don't say that lightly. I just, I have friends who are chefs and their lives are miserable. Don't do that. Go have a good life. Go get a good job. Take care of yourself. Have good work-life balance, man. 
I want that for you. I don't, I don't want you to suffer the way you would have to to be a chef. It's, it's a really, really tough career path. And it's not, you don't make good money. You have horrible hours. You get treated badly. There's nothing good about it. You can do better for your life. And I want that for you, Sam. I don't mean to be painful. I, I, I'm sure you're a great cook. I'm sure you've got all these hobbies and skills. And it's hard to walk away from this thing you're so invested in. But um, at the same time, and I, I can't make a decision for you. I just know that like, I want you to have a good life. And I, I worry that being a chef is not a good life. And I, I think you deserve better. And I, I want you to have better for yourself. So that's my honest two cents, man. Um, if you're looking for someone to say you got, you know, I, the, my blessing to change careers, you get it from me. I, I give you my blessing, man. Go, go find a different path. Go be, go get an electrician's apprenticeship or something or go to college. Like you, you're not too late. You could, but don't subject yourself to the horrible lifestyle that is being a chef. It's just not a good life. It's, it's a terrible, terribly difficult, painful thing to do for a living. And every chef I know has a really tough life because it's just not a good career that takes good care of people. And I can't recommend uh, doing something else enough. Gabe writes in, Gabe says, Hey, Zach, growing up, I never actually knew any other Gabes or Gabriels. To my great surprise, it seems like there are at least three in this community. In order to avoid confusion, I am happy to be, to go by G-Babes, my nickname in high school, my coach gave me. Chicago Gabe, Brazilian or Belgian Gabe, or even Toxic Eagles fan Gabe, you may pick. Anyways, I had a suggestion regarding a question you answered a couple weeks ago. You said you were willing to do multiple fantasy leagues with your patrons. While I think this would be great, as someone who has managed multiple teams, I caution that it could get annoying or confusing to manage more than three. If you're busy with life, depending on how many leagues you want to have, I wanted to suggest perhaps that it would be cool to have a multiple league system with relegations or promotions like in pro soccer leagues. I think it would be cool over many seasons where two, the top two teams in each level get promoted to the higher league and the bottom two get relegated. This could encourage higher participation and people who are more competitive will make it up to the quote premier league. Just a suggestion, take it or leave. Excuse me. I burped. That's a great, absolutely a great idea. Um, it's incentive to do well. I think we'll have the, the 16 people that did last year. And maybe I relegate the two guys who did the worst in that league down to the second league already. I don't know. But I, I really like the idea of relegation and having a cyclical, like, three leagues. And depending on how well you do, you end up in one of those three leagues. And if you're one of the two worst teams, you get relegated. That's a great idea. I love that so much. We're going to do that for sure. Now, I don't know. Full transparency. Your boy Zach is slammed. I'm tired. I don't know if I can even do fantasy football this year. Like I, I mean, let's be clear. We're gonna have a Patreon fantasy league. I just don't know how much I'm gonna really participate because I can't even. I'm so tired, man. Like I, I am, I am emotionally drained between work, between football. Try to do a podcast. Like it's, uh, it's a lot. It's really hard, and I, uh, I don't know, man. I don't know how much I'm going to be participating. I'll, I'll be in the league, but I might I might do some auto stuff or something. I don't know that I'm going to be... Because I got to also watch football at some point. Like, I don't know. It's going to be really hard to do fantasy football this year. It seems like a really daunting task, but I'll, I want to do it, and we'll figure that out. We'll get two more write-ins left. Steve says, Hi, Mr. H. Vac Zach. No, he says, Hi, Mr. H. Zach Vac, a.k.a. my favorite podcaster, AKA the cutest man west of the Mississippi. I'm saving most of my Takasubo filled rants for a later date. Hopefully I'll get featured on an episode of SOS of even or even ZST one day. And yes, I know the Z and the V are flipped from earlier. Haha. My questions are, do you think Ryan Day will get fired if he loses to Michigan, AKA the, school, the team up North this year after Harbaugh left? And how do you know, what love is. What is love? Q Hadaway. So what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. He means that song. Uh, as always, keep it up. I love the show. You're the fucking man. So happy for you. AK, uh, AK 24-7 Ask ETN season. Until next year, hopefully, I'll come up with a better name for fantasy or even a good one. P.S. Yes. Flipping the V and the Z 
was intentional because he said, he said, hi, Mr. H. Zach Vac. Sure. Okay. You have a lot, lot to hear. Could Ryan Day get fired? Yes, for sure. He's got to beat Michigan this year. Jim Harbaugh's gone. They won a national title. Um, I think Ryan Day is on the hot seat. They hired Chip Kelly as the offensive coordinator at Ohio State. There's pressure there. And if Ryan Day doesn't beat Michigan, he could absolutely get fired, in my opinion, honestly. Uh, it would not shock me. How do you know what love is? Love, to me, um, love is caring. I mean, I get loved so well by my, my girlfriend. You got to decide what love is for you. But I, my, my girlfriend shows me I'm loved every day. She, um, she's kind to me. She's patient. She communicates very clearly. Um, she tells me when there's a problem, which is huge. You have to communicate. Like you can't have love without communication and often even uncomfortable communication and direct communication. Um, my, my girlfriend, Molly, man, she makes dinner, which like, I know it sounds like to me, I come home from work really late. I've done work all day, football to come home and have food ready to go. And then have someone who's patient and is just kind to me. It's everything. Love is patience and kindness, understanding and communication. I mean, honestly, like, um, I have all those things and to have them is so great and helpful. Lionheart, last question. Lionheart says, HVAC Zach, let it be known. I coined the term HVAC Zach, by the way. You did, Lionheart? That's awesome. You're the guy who started that? It's great. It's a great name. I appreciate it. Lionheart says, you recently took a coaching job, which is a crazy coincidence because I also have recently taken a coaching job uh, at my JUCO. I've mostly been helping with the offensive line, but our offensive line coach is getting shoulder surgery and it's going to be out for a few weeks, making me the interim offensive line coach. It's been going well, but the only weird part is I don't feel qualified to coach my former teammates. Like I'm really supposed to look them in the eye and critique their run blocking when half of them played with me, and I know I wasn't a great run blocker. I run our practices the way Coach Chewy would, but the past few days I've been sprinkling in some of my own stuff. For example, I started running one of our drills in a King of the Hill style format. I have everyone go through it once to get a rep, and then the King of the Hill starts. The players love it, and it seems to me like they're more focused on the details of their pass blocking because they want to keep winning to stay in and they're looking for every edge they can get. Sorry, I hit my mic. Another thing I'm planning on starting this week is doing conditioning with my players, as in running gassers and sprints alongside them. There were three instances last year where we won a game because we went down and scored with less than a minute left, mainly because our offensive line was so much better conditioned than every opposing defensive line. I really want our guys to view conditioning as an opportunity to get better and not a punishment, which is why I plan on running with them. Now that you're a coach, what are some things you're doing differently from coaches you've had in the past? I know you've changed up the offense a lot from what previous coaches were running. Is there anything else? Um, I don't know. I, I don't have a route tree, believe it or not. Like the numbered system, it just confuses people because if you've been in multiple systems, if you say a one route, does that mean a hitch? Does that mean a slant? Some people, like a nine is usually a vertical, but man, the, the numbering system... If you've been in multiple different offenses that had different numbering systems and meant different things, you're not ever going to be able... It's You're too jumbled in your brain. So I just... I call the routes what they are. A fade, a slant, a deep dig, a comeback, a hitch, a five-yard hitch, a speed out. Like, I call them by their name rather than a number. Um, and I have one-word play calls that are simple. And I've got a quarterback who calls protections. I don't know. I, what am I doing differently? I don't know. I think I just communicate very directly um, and try to show that I care. I think that's maybe different than coaches you know, coaches have done in the past at the school I'm at. I don't know, man. I'm not really worried about being different so much as being myself. Um, if I'm myself but I'm like other people, great. If I'm myself and I'm different, that's also great. I just want to be myself and be me. And by being myself and doing it my way that works for me, I'm able to do a better job because it's authentic to what I'm doing. And I think being authentic and coming across that way is really important. Um, when you're playing like a character of yourself or you're posing and pretending you're something you're not, that is absolutely 
when you have problems. So I'm just myself every day. That's how I coach. That's how I do everything. I just try to be the same person no matter what context you meet me in. Um, and uh, that's been really helping me a lot. Guys, I'm exhausted. It's 5.17 in the morning. Uh, I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to upload this later. I love you. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for tuning in to my weird episode. Um, mostly questions, but it was good. I just, I needed to record something to get myself going. And then um, I've got two ideas for episodes next week. And I, I hopefully will record two episodes next week. But for now, uh, thanks for tuning in. I love you. I appreciate you. I hope you have a great day. And uh, ba-dum-bum, bam, we are